I'm David Murphy from SLR Consulting. With me, I have Victoria Vitri and Noah Slovin. Victoria and I will be presenters and breakout room facilitators, and Noah will be running the Zoom controls. If you have a technical issue uh, with, regarding Zoom, please send Noah a chat or otherwise reach him um, through a message in a platform or email him and he can help you out. I have uh, also with us today, Johanna Greenspan Johnston from Dewberry, who will be a breakout room facilitator. And then we have, I believe, four folks from the Circa team today, John, Joanna, Capra, and Katie. Um, I didn't see Jim's name on the list, but I guess he could always join us um, if he finds time later on, uh, which would be great. So this is the team present today. Um, the objectives of the workshop are as follows, to review the methods that we use to identify potential adaptation and resilience opportunity areas. So we'll talk about, you know, what is a potential adaptation and resilience opportunity area? What do we mean by that? How do we link vulnerability mapping with zones of shared risk to come up with these areas? So we'll cover that. Uh, we'll have some breakout rooms to discuss specific opportunity areas, and we've got some great graphics to help you understand where they're located. Um, and we'll kind of look at the general profile of areas in the Metrocog region, um, and then collect your thoughts about any specific areas. We'll do a report out where we talk about um, if we missed anything, anything look good, look bad, do we want to include something else? Uh, that'll be towards the end of the meeting. And then we'll have an open discussion at the end and kind of uh, go over the next steps in the project. And we'll talk about, we've done this in the past in other meetings, but we'll kind of remind you what kind of projects we're looking for, for these opportunity areas. Um, here's a schedule. So we'll, we've got a presentation that Victoria and I will do till about 1.40. Um, then we'll go into the breakout rooms. We found yesterday that 45 minutes was, was, was fine. It was perfect. It wasn't too long. It wasn't too short. So we're gonna to stick to the same time frame today. We'll do 10 minutes of report out and then an open discussion. And we were, we were done a few minutes early yesterday, so I expect the same today. Um, as always, you're used to this by now with Zoom meetings. If something happens that is a problem um, for all of us, log out, log back in after a few minutes. If there's some kind of power outage and either me or Victoria or Noah is lost from the meeting, uh, have no fear, the other ones of us will carry on. Um, we have multiple versions of this open, so we can keep going. So let's just go through um, a little bit of the background here. And we're not going to do as much uh, background material presentation as we have in the past. But we recognize that some of you have not been present in our workshops um, to date. And so we, have, we wanted to make sure we covered some of the background. So let's get oriented here. So what is a potential regional adaptation resilience opportunity area? It's a lot of words. It's really a mouthful. And I promise I didn't make it up. It came out of our, our scope of work with Circa. So what is the potential? So potential is something that's been identified through some kind of analysis, but we don't know yet whether it's gonna make it to the end of the race, right? Um, something that we're looking at that we're calling potential right now today, um, it may be advanced to further project development or it may not. What is regional? Well, regional means of significance, significance to more than one community. Uh, we're well versed in the word regional in Connecticut because it's been a, a very focused effort over the past couple of decades to be more regional in the state. But it's a small state, so something that's regional could be um, of value to the entire state, or maybe to one county or a cog, or just two towns. What is adaptation? So these are changes that we make over time to address the challenges caused by climate change. And adaptation is actually one part of resilience, which is um, generally speaking, the ability to prepare, withstand, recover from, and adapt to an event like a storm. Um, there are a lot of definitions of resilience. That's really the one that we kind of mean right now in the context of a potential regional adaptation resilience opportunity area, including all those four components, prepare, withstand, recover, adapt. An opportunity. Opportunity is a tricky word, right? So that's usually something that's a challenge and we've kind of put a positive spin on it. It's something that we can do where we have a challenge that exists. And so in this context, it's typically we're talking about a climate related challenge like flooding or heat. And then an area. So an area, we don't mean one parcel. We don't mean hundreds of parcels. Potentially we could, but we don't intend to mean that only. So this is a part of a community, part of a municipality, or maybe a neighborhood. So it's just a, a boundary that we draw that doesn't follow parcel lines or roads necessarily, um, but it's a piece of the community. 
All right, so hopefully that gives you a good introduction to what we mean by potential regional adaptation resilience opportunity area, which continues to be a mouthful to me. So how do we get here? Um, we've had a lot of discussion over the past year. Um, perhaps you followed along with Resilient Connecticut Phase 1. Circa presented the results of Phase 1 at the summit um, this past fall, and we also talked about transition into Phase 2 at the summit. We've been meeting with the COGS um, since October of 2020, the monthly COG board meetings, but also some of the subcommittee, subcommittee meetings, such as the Transportation Technical Advisory Committees and such, giving them updates all along. We had a series of workshops in January and February 2021, uh, focused most, mostly on the climate change um, vulnerability assessment and the index that we developed, which has the acronym CCVI. You'll hear Victoria use that acronym a little bit later. We also focused on the zones of shared risk. And because we couldn't cover everything in the workshop series in January and February, we also had a webinar in March of 2021 to give an update on the CCVI process. Perhaps some of you have seen the, um, the viewer, the RGIS online viewers to look at the CCVI and zones of shared risk. And uh, if you haven't, we'll definitely touch on that topic throughout this workshop today. Uh, remember the area of focus is Fairfield and New Haven counties, which is where Circa is allowed to spend the funding that they received from HUD for this project. Um, you know, we don't really work with counties in Connecticut. County governments don't really exist. So we work within COGS for planning. So there are four COGS that are involved here. Um, we're focusing on uh, all the 51 towns in the two counties for the heat and flood related assessments, but we are focusing on the 31, 33 really, towns with transit oriented development potential today. Um, so there are 31 towns that have TOD potential by virtue of having direct access to a rail line. And then there's two towns that we added, Brookfield and Shelton, because Brookfield could at some point in the future have a rail spur and then Shelton is within walking distance of downtown Derby and it's actually part of the Derby TOD. So that's 31 towns that we're focusing on. You might be wondering, you know, I don't remember stopping at a train station in North Haven. Well, there are towns that we're including that may have uh, potential for TOD in the future. Um, we are not starting from scratch for this project. We, we did not start from scratch. We worked hard with the COGS to collect a lot of information. Uh, the map that you see on the right-hand side, for example, is locations of all the hazard mitigation plan projects um, that have been, um, the, the projects that have some spatial components. So they're, they're in the spatial database. We also looked at plans of conservation and development, uh, CRB, so Resilience Building Workshop, results and that sort of thing. You've seen this graphic before if you've been in any of our uh, webinars or workshops. So we are moving today from the challenges phase uh, to the opportunities phase. We've been talking about this now for a few months. We've been sort of in this slow transition between the challenges and opportunities. And I'm happy to report that we are now in that, that final rectangle on here, opportunities. And I'll mention this again at the end of the meeting today around three o'clock, but we will have a draft report issued in about four weeks to talk about these opportunity areas. Some terms to understand as we kind of talk about how we, how we develop these areas and depicted them. Uh, so on the left-hand side, um, flood vulnerability. So this is a contributor to climate risk, which is associated with and involves flooding. Um, if you remember our workshops and our discussions about the CCVI tool, uh, for the purpose of this project, vulnerability has three components, which is exposure, sensitivity, and then adaptive capacity. That is not everyone's definition of vulnerability. We recognize that, but in the Re Resilient Connecticut um, Phase 1, Phase 2, Phase 3 process, that's the definition used. So you'll notice it does not include uh, the term frequency, uh, which is the one that you usually needs to change vulnerability into risk. So this mapping that we've done that you've seen before is a vulnerability mapping tool. Uh, likewise, heat vulnerability, same definition, but now we're talking about heat. Social vulnerability, so these are factors such as uh, socioeconomic status, lack of access to transportation, um, different types of housing that could weaken the community's uh, resilience to losses during a disaster, or avoidance of losses during a disaster. We've been doing some social vulnerability mapping for this project. Um, it's very consistent with other methods that have been in place, um, CDC, Census Bureau, et cetera. Zones of shared risk, if you've joined us in the past for workshops, you've seen some of this mapping. 
So these are areas that we can draw that face common challenges already or as caused by climate change. Uh, and then therefore risks are shared amongst different kinds of people, stakeholders who can make different choices in an area, but may share um, the outcome of that, those choices that are made. These are primarily flood-based. Some of them are uh, the same as floodplains simply, and some of them are areas that are cut off by flooding. Some of them are areas that are near flooding, but have uh, cascading impacts. A regional asset or a regional piece of infrastructure these are assets that serve more than one community, right? Remember that word regional that we defined a few minutes ago. There is a planned development. These are areas identified in POCDs or regional POCDs uh, for a variety of development, redevelopment types of projects. So we do not mean half of a town that where single family homes will be developed perhaps. We know that is going on, but we're looking at um, redevelopment, mixed uses, that sort of thing commercial, industrial, residential, and is uh, in proximity to one another, uh, perhaps municipal and other kinds of uses as well. Federal opportunity zones, these are defined by the feds. So these are zones that provide tax benefits to people and companies uh, to spur investment. And the state of Connecticut recognizes these zones and you can go right on OPM's website and see where they're located. And then finally, TOD, transit oriented development, so this is development that supports creation of compact pedestrian uh, centered mixed use communities around transit or train stations. stations. So those are all important terms. Um, you're gonna see them come up again and again throughout the presentation and the discussion today on the information sheets that we have for each of the opportunity areas. And the reason they're important to remember, just tuck this away, is we wanna see how any those areas that we've identified um, include or do not include these factors listed here. So let's look at some of the things that we've just talked about. I talked about flood and heat vulnerability. Um, here's an example of the, the gridded area. Um, there, I think I said there were 90,000 cells in New Haven and Fairfield County. This is just kind of the focus on the Scrog region since that's uh, the workshop that we're doing right now. On the left-hand side, the darker blues, the higher flood vulnerability on the right-hand side, the darker reds are the higher heat vulnerability. Not a whole lot of surprises, probably you're thinking. In general, the darker blues are along rivers and the shoreline, and the darker reds are in uh, urban areas where we have a lot of um, development that can hold heat. But some of the high heat areas are in undeveloped areas like tidal marshes that have higher emissivity. And those are things that we talked about back in, in the workshops in January and in the webinar in March. Social vulnerabilities on the left-hand side, you can see that we typically choose to map social vulnerabilities in census track, tracks and blocks. And that is because the data typically is, is available in that way. Um, a lot of the data comes from the Census Bureau and other federal agencies. And so that's kind of how it's, uh, we're, we're capable of mapping it. Um, on the right-hand side is an image of a zone of shared risk. And if you've been in some of our zones of shared risk discuss discussions in the past, this will look familiar to you. Um, this is a little piece of the community, a downtown area where we have some darker green um, polygons around flood zones, and then kind of a lighter green polygon around an area that can become isolated during flood. Um, if you have time after this workshop and you want more information on zones of shared risk, there is a viewer that's available in the story map. And there's also a page on Circa's website for Resilient Connecticut of all about zones of shared risk. Um, here are some examples of regional assets and infrastructure. Um, probably a lot of the things that are listed here are not going to be a surprise. And I, I led on a couple of these already. So uh, assets and infrastructure that serve numerous communities by spanning the region. So that would be our rail lines. So Amtrak, Metro North, don't forget, CT Rail. Hopefully you've taken the train from Hartford to New Haven in the past. Uh, the interstate highways, et cetera major water systems such as Aquarian Water Company, Regional Water Authority, uh, sewer systems so such as Greater New Haven Water Pollution Control Authority, which is, uh, dominates in the Scrog region, um, and then Eversource and UI uh, transmission systems and distribution systems. What about regional assets that serve numerous communities from one location? So that could be state facilities like courthouses, it could be uh, state DOT highway garages, hospitals for sure. Not every town has a hospital. We typically need to go, um, if we're in Brookfield, we go to Danbury, if we're in uh, Bethany, we go to New Haven, et cetera. 
major ports, airports um, are compute as included as the regional assets. Some of the um, more interesting examples, so not in the Scrag region, but the Danbury Mall is used for mass distribution um, during emergencies and was used for vaccinations during this uh, ongoing pandemic. Yukon branches and then colleges in the C CSCU system are included as regional assets. And then regional economic assets. Um, I live in West Hartford Center or near, nearby, so I would say that's a regional economic uh, asset. I see all the cars from out of state uh, driving by my house all the time, um, but that's outside the region. So what's inside the Scrag region? Well, major employers, uh, major employment areas, large tourist sites, museums, historic districts, uh, Longworth area, Steel Point area, which is outside the region of Bridgeport, and big retail shopping centers, that sort of thing. So IKEA, yes, would fit into this uh, list in the Scrag region. Why do we, uh, just one thing real quick, why do we include historic districts? It's important to recognize here in Connecticut that um, historic and cultural resources are managed by SHPO, which is under DECD, and they're definitely considered economic assets. Um, and we could have a whole day kind of debating why that's the case, but it's important to include them as well. Here's an example of a planned development area and a transit-oriented development area. In this case, we chose Wallingford because it's inside the region. So the left-hand side is an area that the PUCD identifies for um, specific development goals. On the right-hand side are some of the drawings in Wallingford's planning documents about um, the TOD area on the lower. And then the upper right is actually an image that we made in ArcGIS of the drive shed from the middle of the TOD area. So I show you this image because later on in, this, in the breakout sessions, you'll see that shaded crosshatch, and that's what um, it represents as the drive shed from the TOD area, within the TOD areas, which of course are not circles and ovals because roads don't, aren't made out that way. Okay, I'm going to take a break from talking and turn over things to Victoria. Thank you, David. Um, <clears throat> okay, so taking all that into consideration, um, all of these different resources and all of these different um, kind of speaking opportunities. Uh, a lot of feedback was provided from stakeholders during workshops and surveys and things like that. So now I'm going to kind of attempt to walk through the process of identifying these um, resilience opportunity areas, taking all of these resources into account and in kind of how we overlaid and intersected to try to find these sweet spots of, um, you know, the vulnerabilities whether it was heat or flood, um, you know, the social impacts, the planning uh, and TOD areas and things like that. So kind of used for our foundation, you can see we've got these pink areas, which are all of the zones of shared risk. So in all, we have 656 throughout New Haven and Fairfield counties. Um, so you could see it's a little, it's kind of an awkward pattern here. Um, and this is because we really focused on those municipalities that have um, immediate TOD potential. So looking at those areas where, you know, we can focus um, in on these TOD areas for, you know, these opportunity areas. Um, so of the 656, we identified 626 as being regional. So not a huge difference, um, but what does that mean? That means that all of these green ones that you see here have at least one of those assets that David was talking about. So whether it's the cross or that transboundary asset, such as I-95 or the Merit, whether it's that more locational, um, so within a municipality, but serving other municipalities, or if it's an economic asset, so if it's a major employer or historic resource and things like that. So 626 have at least one of those assets. So to help us to try to narrow down the field um, and identify again that the, those sweet spots, right? Which might be more uh, regional. So we tried to take a, a few different approaches, um, which again, we're hoping we'll get a little more feedback um, in the breakouts. Um, but we thought, let's take a look at the percentages and how that's kind of distri uh, distributed. So we identified the top 20% of these regional zones of shared risk or these RZSR, you might see this acronym a little bit. Um, so taking a look at this top 20%, now you could see you've kind of, kind of highlighted those in purple. So this is based on the number of assets within the regional zones of shared risk. So this top 20%, um, all of these purple ones have at least six assets um, with the top 
which I believe there's only one, um, has 16 assets. So again, that might be roadways, railways, um, employers, and uh, you know, one of 16, between six and 16 of all of those assets that Dave described. So that narrows down our field to 86. So, okay, we're, we're getting a little more, you know, manageable, right? When we talk opportunity areas, we don't wanna say we have 656 of them. So, um, you know, trying to find these sweet spots again. So now we've kind of narrowed down this top 20%. Um, so we wanna identify the intersection of these regional zones of shared risk with some of these other resources that we have been developing um, and enhancing. So we took a look at the CCVIs. We took a look at the high flood and the high heat um, areas. So you could see these are kind of these teal areas, which we'll have a chance to look at them a little up close, um, a little more up close. We've got some screenshots and then in the breakouts as well. Um, but so you can see these teal areas or these high flood, high heat areas. So we want to try to identify where's the, the highest vulnerabilities throughout the region. We again looked at the TOD areas. Um, so taking a look at that half mile to three quarters of a mile area around our rail stations. We looked at planned future development. So pulling out from the POCDs and, and other planning documents, you know, where is there, where is um, development being discussed? Where is there potential development or redevelopment? Um, you know, something that we can possibly link to when we're discussing and designing these resilience opportunity areas, right? So if there's projects going on, um, we want to be a part of it. So, Sorry, nope, that's fast. okay. I know, I, there was a tough slide. I said there was a lot of animations. We'd, we'd see how we do. Um, right, so we found these intersections of the regional zones and all of these different, um, you know, all of these resources. So one thing to keep in mind, um, is you know, we're looking at this map right now and it looks very simple, right? We've only got a few different things that we've intersected. So it, you, know, you might be thinking, well, there's not a lot going into identifying these areas. But looking at underneath, um, you know, if we were to pick apart only these three or four different uh, layers that we intersected, there's a lot of data driving this, right? So this high flood, this high heat scenario, these CCVIs have been um, developed We've developed a few iterations and there's, I believe, 50 to 60 different types of data driving that CCVI, right? So we've got a lot of data identifying these vulnerable areas. These TOD areas, um, A, are based on where the rail stations are, but B, we've also looked at some of these TOD plans, right, to try to hash out um, some of these planning efforts, as well as the future plan development um, areas, looking at the POCDs and drawing these areas. So that's a lot of planning effort that's gone into identifying those areas. Um, and then the zones of shared risk as well. You know, we've done a few iterations of those and those have been edited and um, we, you know, we've made several changes based on feedback and you know, some of the great um, comments that we got from the workshop. So it may look like a pretty simple map, but I just want you to keep in mind that there's a lot of data underneath all of these, um, these layers kind of driving it. So just one main point I wanna make. So, um, so we kind of use that intersection map, right? We found all of these areas where uh, we have our regional zones intersecting with our high heat, high flood, TOD, planning areas. And then when taking a look, we wanted to try to put this human element into it. Um, so now how do we start to identify these areas? What is an opportunity area? Um, how are we driving the size of it? How are we identifying, um, and I don't wanna say prioritization because we're not quite there yet, um, you know, but how are we deciphering between some of these areas that are all perfectly intersected and they aren't in some areas that are important, but don't perfectly intersect. So we kind of developed this idea of these tier ones and these tier twos. So it's, like I said, it's not based on prioritization. It's not that tier one are all of the ones that are going to make it into, you know, the next phase or, and tier twos are going to sit on a shelf. It's really that tier ones. So you could see here in this graphic, um, tier ones are those ones that really had that ultimate intersection, I like to say. Sounds very dramatic, the ultimate intersection. But, you know, you could see we have our purple regional zone of shared risk. It's pretty encompassed by our high heat, high flood scenario, which is all of that kind of light beigey yellow color, right? So we've got high flood, high heat all around this regional zone of shared risk. Um, we have several different assets. That's why we have it as the regional uh, zone. So there's at least six assets within this area. We do have um, a TOD area. So this regional zone is pretty encompassed in this TOD area as well, right? So we have all of these things kind of perfectly overlaid um, in our tier ones. But then if we take a look at a tier two, um, and I think if you click one more time, David, perfect, thank you. If you take a look at a tier two, we have all of those same elements in this tier two opportunity area. 
um, they're just not quite all lining up perfectly. So we have, again, those regional zones. We have our, you know, the purple areas, the regional zones of shared risk. Uh, we do have a TOD area. We have some of that high flood, high heat area, um, but it's not, they're not all perfectly lining up, right? But we don't want to discount this area because it's high, you know, high number of assets and it's got all of this, uh, you know, the vulnerability that I don't want to say it's what we're looking for, but on the map, it's what we're looking for, right? We're trying to identify um, these high vulnerable areas. So again, going forward, don't think of tier one or tier two as a prioritization. Just in the back of your mind, know that a tier one likely has, you know, that perfect intersection of everything that we've been looking at. Um, and then a tier two has almost all of those elements. They just aren't quite lining up perfectly. And so what that might mean going forward into, um, you know, project development or project design as we move further into the uh, into phase two and ultimately into phase three is, you know, identifying a tier one and tier two lets us know that vulnerability or TOD potential or redevelopment potential, you know, might just be distributed, distributed a little bit differently in a tier two than it is in a tier one. Um, so again, not prioritization, just trying to help us identify uh, how these areas or our dis how distribution is within these areas. So after doing the overlays, after trying to find these intersections of all of the different resources, um, this is ultimately the SCRAG um, opportunity areas as it is right now. So, uh, and we'll, we'll dig into these a little bit more, but so right now we have uh, 12 opportunity areas. It is uh, distributed throughout, again, throughout the region, as you can see, pretty concentrated along the TOD uh, corridors, along those lines. Um, so we have a few along the shore and a few inland. I think it's one in Meriden, we have two in Wallingford, one in North Haven, we have three in New Haven, uh, one in West Haven, two in Milford, uh, and then one in Branford and one in Guilford. So another thing to keep in mind, right? So I just said that those are the ones that we've identified to date. You know, we're hoping to take some of the feedback that, and I was just looking at the surveys this morning, we've already gotten a few folks that answered the surveys. So great, thank you. You know, we're hoping to look in, to receive some of the feedback during these workshops to see if we need to tweak this identification method um, to make sure that you know overlooking or you know missing anything. Um, also, these regional zones of shared risk. All of this information is going to live on, so we're highlighting that even these regional zones of shared risk, whether it's the 626 or the 86 regional zones of shared risk, those top tier, um, you know they're all critical in their own sense. It's all you know, relative to each municipality. Um, so we're here to try to identify all the vulnerabilities throughout the region and then kind of find those, um, again, those sweet spots of intersection. So, so this is what we have right now for the opportunity areas. And then I think, um, right, so getting ready now for the breakout discussion. So we're not quite there yet. I'm gonna present a little more info on what we're going to look at in the breakout. So, so some things to keep in mind. <clears throat> Um, as we start to get into the breakout discussion in a few minutes here, um, these, uh, you know, these, have, again, as I've said several times, these areas are based on the overlays, right? Flood, heat, social zones, regional assets, and infrastructure. Um, so this isn't the end all be all where, you know, we'll take into account all of the information that we get back from these workshops and from the surveys, you know, to help tweak some things, right? We're hoping that we've really captured everything that um, goes into identifying an opportunity area, but something to keep in mind, um, you know, that if we've missed anything, and it, hopefully I don't think we, I think we're doing pretty good, again, based on what I've read from the surveys, but, um, and then each of these areas is going to be presented on their own individual page. So I'll, I'll present to you a couple of the pages that we'll review, um, but each opportunity area does have several pages of data, um, you know, that we can take a look at. Um, going through some of these pages, and it's not quite as imperative for you to, to remember these numbers, but we do have some scores on some of these sheets from a zero to one. So anything that's on the, on the higher end, closer to one, is usually more vulnerable. So whether that's heat or flood um, or social vulnerability. So a 0.9 and a 0.5 um, are just a little bit, you know, they're only a small difference, but relative to, um, you know, to the region, uh, there's some, some big differences on the vulnerability scale there. Um, but that's okay, you know, we can, we can walk you through um, some of those numbers as we're looking through those sheets. Um, the zones of shared risk, another thing that we've done is we have ID'd these zones um, to help us identify which watershed they are. 
So again, not super imperative for today, but as you're taking a look at the viewer um, and some of the tools that we've put together, um, for example, here we have 5206, so that's the Harbor Brook watershed. So if you were to click on a zone, um, there's a lot of different information going into it, but um, it, it helps folks um, and users identify the watershed. And then the areas of planned development. Um, so again, a lot of this, like we said, we're not starting from scratch. So all of these planned development areas have been gathered from other community plans. Um, so the names you know, that we're selecting here, we're using here kind of a work in progress. We're doing our best to identify um, you know, these local, whether it's development areas or you know, the, the opportunity areas. Um, you know, if we, again, work in progress, that's why we're always working with uh, local stakeholders to get that local knowledge. So just a few hints. Um, and then I think we have some other things that I want you all to keep in mind as I'm going through these next couple pages. And then as we're jumping into the breakouts, looking more specifically at these zones, um, at these opportunity areas that are a little more um, geographically relative to your location. So are there other assets in a particular area that may have been overlooked? So David went through the, those few tables there, um, telling you, you know, to show you what we've looked at to identify these opportunity areas. Is there a certain type of asset we missed? Is there a specific asset that you wanna make sure we didn't miss that wasn't overlooked? Um, or maybe there's assets that are within your community or within you know, a certain part of the region that maybe often get overlooked or might potentially have, you know, let us know. We wanna make sure we're really capturing all of that. Um, again, are there any located outside? Um, are there resources or assets located outside of the area that um, will alleviate some vulnerability? So by trying to identify these resources that may be just outside of an opportunity area will help us develop this idea of resilience corridors. So I won't get into too much of that today, um, but really, we're really working to try to link some of these vulnerable areas to these resilient areas, right? So if there's a resource nearby, um, one of these opportunity areas, let us know if it's some type of facility or you know, transportation hub or something like that. Um, that way we can work to link these vulnerable and resilient areas. If there's a specific flood or a heat risk in within one of these resilience opportunity areas, you know, let us know. We, we can take all of this information um, and kind of build it into um, this ever evolving database of these opportunity areas or these regional zones, right? Um, and then are there any other planning efforts occurring in some of these opportunity areas? So, you know, we flashed a few graphics already. You might be thinking, oh, well, you know, there's a possible plan here. We're having discussions about this project or this project. Um, you know, let us know, right? We want to capitalize on some of these planning efforts. So again, something to keep in mind as we start the discussion and breakouts. So going forward, um, as we'll start to take a closer look, and I think we've got the couple examples here. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this looks like a lot going on here on this page, um, but I'll break it down quickly. And I'm not going to go through every single one, but we do have these sheets for all of the opportunity areas. So those 12 areas that I talked about, um, throughout New Haven, Wallingford, um, and along the shoreline, um, you know, we do have this data on all of these regional zones of shared risk. So here we have one in Meriden. Um, so we're taking a look on the right side of the graphic. We have our flood vulnerability and we have our heat vulnerability. So this is all based on the CCVI, right, that climate change vulnerability index. So you know, identifying these opportunity areas is great, right? We, we know where the vulnerabilities are, but now we need to dig in a little bit deeper, right? How are we kind of picking apart these vulnerabilities use, with all of these resources that we've um, used to identify them, right? So uh, on the top, we've got our flood vulnerability, on the right top, we have our flood vulnerability. Um, so you could see all the variation of colors in the grid cells. So um, our average score here is a 4.41 for flood. So that's on a scale of one to five, right? So telling us that this zone of shared risk in, New, uh, in Meriden is relatively high flood vulnerability. Um, and the same goes for heat. If you look just below that, that's a 4.49. So that's an average score of all those grid cells within that zone of shared risk. Um, so again, on a scale of one to five, a pretty high heat vulnerability. So what does that look like combined, right? That's one, another um, aspect that we've been looking at combination of flood and heat vulnerability, right? How are we addressing um, multiple climate change stressors? So you can see we've got this uh, pretty bright colored grid cell to show us that, you know, the top right corner is a really high combination of flood and heat. If the bottom of this several grid cell, Punnett square I like to call it, were highlighted, that would tell us that we have low heat and low flood. So you can see that throughout this, uh, this regional zone of shared risk here, 
we do have some spots that are pretty high uh, flood and heat. We also do have some patches that are a little higher heat, but lower flood, and then kind of some variations in between, right? So again, this is another tool when I keep, you know, when I mentioned before looking at the distribution throughout the opportunity area, this is another great tool that we can use to locate where are these high heat, high flood areas, but maybe there's some other areas that are just high flood or just high heat within this one zone, right? So it's a, it's a, a finer scale than just looking at, you know, that overall kind of circle or oval opportunity area shape. So this is one resource we've been using. Um, and then I think, right, so if we jump forward, this is a little bit more general, but this is kind of characterizing it a step um, in, a, in a different direction versus the technical numbers that I was just talking about. So we do have some of the general numbers of the overall flood vulnerability, slightly different scale here, um, which is a, the normalized scale for flood heat and social vulnerability. But you could see that they're fairly well aligned with the graphics that I just showed you, a moderate to high vulnerability for flood heat and social. Um, but taking it a step further, like I said, what's going on in this opportunity area? What are some of the assets we have? Um, there's some electric substations. We do have some law enforcement locations in here. We have the CT rail and Am Amtrak line located in this opportunity area. Um, what about some areas of planned development? We've got the West Main Street and East Main Street commercial zone redevelopment um, that was identified in the POCD, I believe. Um, this is a federal opportunity zone. And then the TOD area here is the Meriden Station. So again, just trying to characterize these opportunity areas and exactly what's going on. Um, the infrastructure isn't the complete list of all of the assets. Um, these are kind of just a, it's an overview, quick highlight. Um, but this is just one example. So we've developed these sheets and we've developed these graphics for all of these opportunity areas uh, throughout the Scrog region and throughout the, uh, you know, the other Cog regions as well. Um, again, to help us to help us characterize kind of what's going on. So um, you've seen these graphics, right? So what is this telling us? What is this going to, you know, what's our end game here, right? We've got a lot of grid cells with a lot of numbers and hash marks and colors and things like that, right? So we're looking at these sweet spots of intersections to try to identify what's going on, what's that vulnerability, what's driving that vulnerability, is it built, is it ecological, is it social? Um, and then how do we, where do we take that, right? So we're using the Meriden here because this is a great example of, you know, identifying vulnerabilities and pushing it to the next level um, and implementing some projects, right? That's, that's what we're here to do, um, identify these areas to help build resilience. So here we've got the Meriden Green Flood Mitigation Project. Um, it's in pretty close proximity to the Meriden TOD, right? So you can see the pictures on the bottom here, you know, we've got the pre-flood and post-flood um, stage of the Meriden Green Project. You know, we've got the overall drawings, but this is a really great, great way to kind of bring this all together, right? There's a little bit in between this drawing and those couple sheets I showed you, which is really why we're here today. Um, but um, understanding what's driving the vulnerability within these regions, capturing the assets within the opportunity areas and adjacent to and in proximity to these opportunity areas, and really getting an understanding of some of these vulnerabilities that are present within the opportunity area um, to help us better identify, um, you know, those that will, you know, to characterize them all for the, for the plan, but also to help us, um, you know, further characterize those moving forward in phase two and ultimately phase three of Resilient Connecticut. So um, that's a quick overview on the selection of the opportunity areas. Um, so like I said, we do have 12 different areas in the Scrog region. Um, we have those sheets and we have all of those graphics. We also, um, for each of the areas, and we'll be breaking you all out into similar like we did with the first workshop, if you joined us, if not um, similar to the first workshop, we kind of broke everybody out based on their geographic um, you know, relation. So that way we can try to hone the conversation and a little more focused on a few different areas. So I think we could take a minute or two um, if anybody has any questions right now before we break out. Um, if there's no questions, we also will have a few minute break um, just before breakouts start. So if there's any questions, you can drop anything into the chat quick if you wanted to raise a hand. Um, you might be able to unmute yourself as well if there's anything right now. If not, we'll let you all have a few minutes and then we'll join back in the breakouts. Welcome back to the main room, everyone. I will uh, wait to see that I have Victoria back. See Scott, yep. Chokat.
Right. Let's um, let's see if we still have Johanna and Scott. Maybe we can have them go first for a report out. I think they might have to jump off, Dave. Just a note. Oh yeah, go ahead. All right. Thanks. Yeah, I think Scott might have already or jumped. Um, I was just about to. Um, oh. Do you got the report out? Uh, sure. Yeah, I can do it. Okay. All right. Um, so our team, our group had a, a good conversation. We talked a lot about the different types of, you know, how are we defining criticality and reg regionality and what other types of infrastructure might be included in that. So for example, natural gas infrastructure, um, both fuel storage ports and other, and the value of transportation infrastructure. Um, talked about the during COVID, how some areas were were adapted for mass vac sites and that kind of quick adapted use elements and how that is playing into the way we think about critical infrastructure, particularly for responsive recovery. Um, food distribution centers uh, emer and other emergency sur services. So a lot of different ideas of, of where to go and, and bring into that discussion around involving more data for that. So we'll definitely be took good notes and we'll be sharing that uh, with the team to, to explore further. Um, we also talked about how these we're looking at you know, different systems and different players and whether it's utilities or private companies that are serving as food distribution centers and how they might have their own resilience assessments going on and their own funding sources and making sure that everyone, that we're thinking about that as we go towards developing projects that those elements are are syncing up and that we're really thinking about what projects are out on the pipeline so that when funding becomes available we can execute um, and the difference between projects that you know maybe are more infrastructure based and how that really need funding and and coordination across partners versus ones that are more on um, softer options around policy and and smaller community-based infrastructure and community-based planning um, and how we might wanna treat those differently. Anything else to add on we talked about? Uh, maybe Joanna or Jim, who are also in that session. Yep, thanks for the input, it's great. All right. Um. Victoria, do you want me to go next? It uh, doesn't uh, matter. Yeah. Okay. Um, I had the, the team that was mostly focused on the city of New Haven. Um, and we had a good discussion, actually, that really was largely, uh, the first half of the discussion was about heat vulnerability um, and the importance of understanding um, why, why heat vulnerability is located where it is. We talked about um, building stock efficiencies, whether cooling is present, um, do we have the ability to map some of that? Um, and we were the discussion was also very forward-looking in terms of you know if there's opportunities to come out of this project, uh, retrofitting buildings for more cooling and more efficiency in heating and cooling, that might be a good outcome. Um, we you know the statement was made, and I'm just looking at my notes. Some of the highlights. One of the statements was, you know, existing affordable housing needs to be efficient, and that's understood. But it also needs to be affordable to run the heating and cooling equipment that you need when it's efficient. So these are all things that might need to be aligned with um, the areas of opportunities that go forward in the pilot projects. Um, we talked about Fairhaven a lot as kind of the an example of that area where this could this could happen? Where would we make cooling efficiencies and uh, incorporate cooling? And we talked about why, you know, why fair human was this on a shared risk. It's not just the heat vulnerability, it's also the isolation vulnerability. Um, if people can't get out of Fairhaven during a flood event because of bridges or roads being, being out of commission and they're sheltering in place, they need to be able to stay cool and not uh, be uncomfortable when they shelter in place. So all of that sort of came together um, as kind of a set of ideas for, for going forward in the area of, of heat vulnerabilities. Um, a lot of other things we talked about, uh, the need to maximize the potential for funding. Um, we talked about the BRIC program. 
Uh, we talked about backup power, power redundancies. Um, we talked a little bit about um, social capital uh, and how building social capital might be kind of, in a lot of cases, as important as building a flood wall or building other kinds of ways to reduce risks. Um, we talked a lot about food security and Havis Harvest in, New in Hamden, which is an organization, an example of an organization that has some ability to build social capital for food security. Um, so we might want, might want to look into more kind of parallels to, to Havens Harvest, other organizations that can build other kinds of social capital. Um, and that's pretty much most of it, I think. Um, I played it this too much. We had specific ideas as well. I kind of glossed over those just for the sake of doing the report out. Victoria? Yeah, so um, we were uh, Brantford, Madison, and Guilford. So uh, we had some pretty good conversation on the different types of assets and you know whether or not we're really capturing what's regional in those uh, municipalities. And I think for the most part, we were, were pretty on point. Um, some specifics that really came up were, uh, you know, the treatment plants um, and marinas, right? So I'm not sure if we have really accounted for marinas and all of the activity that's um, occurring, for example, on the Brantford River um, and then on the shoreline, um, you know, making sure we're taking that into account when we're taking a look at these regional assets. <laughs> um, some other things that were mentioned, such uh, the Guilford Fairgrounds, Madison Surf Club, uh, Madison, Madison Beach Hotel. So, you know, these are locations that bring in a lot of out-of-towners um, and a lot of kind of regional events and region-wide locations. So trying to take these into account if they're not already. Um, those were just a few examples that were brought up. Then we talked a little bit about prioritization of these opportunity areas and what we might be, um, you know, what we might be looking to, to help us prioritize. Um, some of the conversation was had about, you know, rail stations and treatment plants. Um, and Katie may be able to add a note or two because I was having some technical screen sharing difficulties. So there's a couple gaps here, but um, you know, looking at the TOD and the, and the wastewater treatment plants, um, and then it kind of came up is how are we, you know, how, it was a great question. How are we addressing um, in our data that this is not a static equation and it's not a static scenario? Um, so a question that I don't think could, I was able to answer in a concise couple sentences, but um, you know, taking into account all of the efforts, the planning efforts and, um, you know, current mapping data and future projections and, you know, doing the best we can to identify those opportunity areas and those specific locations that, you know, need to be hardened and can't move and others that maybe can move, um, you know, and just adapting our planning to the location or to the opportunity area. So it was a pretty good, um, good thought provoking question here that I've, I've got started a couple times. Um, some of the other priorities in the in this part of the region, um, you know, taking into account the state DOT in Guilford, you know, I said, what is a, a, a resource outside of your municipalities that if it were to go down, there'd be an issue. I suggested, you know, DOT, there's a location in Guilford. Uh, another note was, you know, the hospitals, right? That would be a big issue. Uh, we chatted a little bit about evacuation, evacuation routes in the town, some being main roads, um, 146, Neck Road, and then kind of how can we connect these uh, smaller non-regional neighborhoods, these pockets, um, you know, to some more regional areas. So, you know, we talked a little bit about linking these, these pockets to the Brantford TOD area. Um, and then I just asked directly, what's, you know, are there any resilience projects going on? Um, in Guilford, Brantford, Madison each have some good projects. Uh, Guilford's relocating, thinking about, these are kind of in the early stages, all of these projects, you know, relocating public works um, and making that a kind of floodable TOD area. Um, Brantford's taking a look at the wastewater treatment plant and those vulnerabilities um, and then making town center more resilient and then Madison's taking a look at uh, wastewater management um, to avoid kind of sewer, uh, sewer failure and, and saltwater issues along the coast there. Um, so we really touched on a lot of different, uh, a little bit on a few different topics um, and then I've got the regional water authority here, right, those assets as well so not forgetting those uh, those water, water sources as well. So a lot of, uh, a lot of good points and, and questions and topics here. Um, I don't know if Katie or Yaprak has anything to add. But. No, I think you captured the conversation nicely. I mean, people were really involved in the discussions and I think we got some great ideas. Um, I did just put in the chat a link to the webpage that has 
um, some of these resources in the viewer and story map on it. So check that out and there's a place to provide comment and feedback if you think of things after even the workshop today. Thanks, Well, we can, we can go through the last couple slides and then um, just leave it for open discussion for the time that we have left. We're making new progress here. Um, so in terms of the next steps, we want to talk about you know, what happens next logistically, but also where we're kind of going with the project. So um, we've kind of have a draft, we're going to have a draft report of potential uh, areas to be, to be issued in June, June, which I can't believe is only days away. John will have to talk about that, <laughs> kidding. Uh, in June of 2021, which is coming past, we'll describe the flood and heat uh, assessments that we've been doing the CCBI that we've talked about at length, the zones of shared risk, the TOD areas, regional assets infrastructure, that'll all really be part of that report. It'll kind of explain how we got to the point where we are right now that we've discussed in the workshop. Um, going forward after June into July, August, there'll be a kind of sustained transition from phase two of Brazilian Connecticut to phase three. And during that time, Circa's team will work with the COGS, um, the towns and state agency partners to kind of advance the planning and look at which areas can become so-called pilot projects over the next few years. Uh, and again, the, the point will be um, where can the most impact be made kind of with the investment available? Uh, where's the best um, benefit to cost ratio in terms of the benefits of reducing flood and heat risks and other things that we've talked about um, in today's session. And where there's leverage possible, I think, you know, Wayne, it was you who said it in our breakout session just a, just a half an hour ago, you used the word leverage and, and I, we capture it here on this page as well. There needs to be the ability for the municipality or the state to participate and kind of maximize the resources uh, for the outcome. Um, and Circle will also help identify other funding opportunities going forward, whether it's FEMA, BRIC, or other sources that are potentially available in the future. Um, we, we looked at this example earlier when we looked at how to depict the zones of shared risk and heat and flood vulnerabilities and how that is overlaid to identify potential opportunity areas. So I won't rehash this one again, but the difference now is when I show you this graphic for the second time, I've got four questions on the right-hand side. Okay, so what are the flood-related uh, benefits? What are the heat-related benefits? So we can say what those are. We can tell. We can look at the image and, and we know what those are. Heat-related benefits, well, we've got some green space. Not a lot of shade yet, uh, but Meriden Green has just been constructed and the trees are still small. Um, but it is, it's green space instead of buildings. What are the flood-related benefits? Well, there's an area that the Harbor Brook can flood now rather than flooding the buildings that used to be there. And there's some space in the floodplain for, for flood mitigation. What are the benefits to vulnerable populations? Um, this is a public space. It's next to public housing, across the street from public housing. Uh, there's a band shell. There's areas to, to congregate for community events. Um, and what's the connection to resilient corridors? We haven't talked about resilient corridors a lot today, but that's an important part of this project. Uh, we have um, the rail station, which is, you can see it on the image to the left, um, just off to the side to the left. Um, there's transit that goes by this area. It's not far from I-691. Um, so there's the potential for resilient corridors to kind of benefit from this project going forward. Um, so that's, that's a project that's been built, right? It's easy to talk about what's been built. It's kind of harder to talk about what hasn't been built, but we've got some good examples in that realm as well. So you've heard a lot about Resilient Bridgeport, which is going on at the same time as Resilient Connecticut. This is funding that's also from the federal government, just like Resilient Connecticut. And Resilient Bridgeport will result in flood protection, uh, elevated roads and pedestrian access will hopefully look very much like the image that you see in the center of the screen. And the flood protection will reduce flood risk to the south end of Bridgeport. Um, but what are, there's other, some other components of the project. There's a resilience center, uh, which can be used kind of as a shelter and for community events. So you can start to ask yourself the same questions. What are the flood related benefits from this project? It's flood protection. What are the heat related benefits? There's green space, there's a place to go for cooling. What are the benefits to the vulnerable populations? So again, keep those questions in mind as we think about the kinds of projects that can come out of these opportunity areas 
I think I've just got one more, which is uh, very close by in Bridgeport. It's the rebuild by design focus area. It's an example of existing housing that's um, a lot of work's being done to separate storm and sanitary sewer to alleviate some of the flooding that's occurred. It'll be an area that is set aside for some uh, managing stormwater, reducing some flood risk from stormwater uh, that's occurred in the past. Um, and there's other component projects as well. You can ask the same questions that we've been asking. What are the flood related benefits? What are the heat related benefits? And then what are the benefits to vulnerable populations? So we want to keep those questions in mind as we think about these potential areas that we've looked at today and as we recast them into pilot projects. Uh, Katie, you put some of these in the chat. Thank you for doing that. But there's other, um, just a reminder of the resources that are available. Resilient Connecticut website, uh, the climate fact sheets that Circa has developed, the, um, the CCVI, the Climate Change Vulnerability Index viewer, uh, and the story map that includes a way to get to all the different viewers, zones of shared risk, as well as the CCVI. And uh, there's also a page for the opportunity areas um, at that story map. So with that, I think we're, we have time for open discussion. Any other questions, comments? Uh, I can give it back to John if you have any comments you want to make to the group. Any comments, questions, thoughts? The floor to Jim. It's always a risk in doing that. <laughs> I resemble that remark. Hey. So, okay, since you asked me, I, I just want to make sure everyone uh, who knows about projects coming that are on the table some in some town or some part of the state, bring them forward and let us know. You know, I think it's, it's a really concerned that, that there are things that are important that we don't know about, even though we've been pretty uh, expansive in our consultation. Things are evolving all the time and they may pop up and we might not have built them into our thinking yet. So it's important to get that forward soon. Dave, I'll just add a comment. That... Oops, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead, Wayne. Um, I had a meeting earlier today with George Bradner from the State Insurance Department, and we're trying to come up with a pilot program for affordable housing uh, in Connecticut to look at the fortified roofing standard, which is kind of a, you know, a a resilient retrofitting of, of roofing. It's been very successful in the Southern US where there's more hurricane risk and it's um, promoted by the Insurance Building Housing Society, IBHS. Um, Rhode Island's interested in it as well. And I told them that I'd be on this call today and I would just mention it that, um, that there's a need to get insurance involved with um, more resilient building standards in Connecticut. And this, we thought a pilot program as kind of a stretch code would be a nice way to introduce it so that we weren't forcing it on anybody, but that we could use it as a way to demonstrate for, um, you know, a better roofing system for the next 30 years, especially for affordable housing. Um, they have a commercial standard already developed for it. So it's a matter of training the construction workforce to do it and then having somebody inspect it and then it gets approved and kind of receives a certification as if it was like a green building or something, but it's the fortified roofing certification. And what we're hoping is if we show it to insurance companies, they'll say, if, if, if your home has this fortified roofing, we will lower your insurance on your home. So that's the goal. We're, we're looking to try to pilot it. We thought Bridgeport would be a great place to try it out. So maybe later in the year, we'll be having more information about that. It's kind of an outgrowth. So would you be looking for, looking for other communities to pilot that, Wayne? And yeah. Could that be incorporated? The, you know, the issue is we're, we're thinking the Connecticut Green Bank might be a resource for us um, to help um, with the cost of it. Um, and introducing it, and then we need we need we need a contractor that's willing to take the training 
to be able to actually install it. So, um, but any community that has what they think is like an ideal affordable housing complex that needs a new roof, that, that would be a great start. That's a great point, Wayne. I think Dave's been really keen to get like a wind hazard map. Yeah, well, I know <laughs> like up here at Cape Cod is, you know, very concerned about the wind hazard map and, and uh, there's uh, different insurance underwriting in Massachusetts than the way they do it in Connecticut. So we're trying to figure out how to come up with a pilot program that could work in all three states so that so I, maybe, I being, you know, so Connecticut, Rhode Island could be first. Yeah. So I was being slightly facetious there in, in there. <laughs> Uh, I couldn't help myself, just came out unprofessionally. But I think oh. you're right that, that we, the, one of the reasons that we, we didn't um, include wind hazard in, 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 our, uh, in our analysis right now was that we found it difficult to, to, uh, to have, quant have quantitative arguments that some areas are more hazardous than others. And, and in the uh, insurance change that occurred about five or ten years ago when they ended up with the commissioner getting pilloried in the press uh, they were using uh, zip codes as the areas to that resolved high and low risk for wind which didn't make any sense to people and i think that was why you know the insurance department got got harassed um, because the projections were just inconsistent with people's perceptions of what the risk was yeah. So, so, so I think we, we need to try and figure out like which parts of the towns elevations are really at higher risk. I think if we do that, then I think there's a good case that we could target uh, the at risk properties more effectively, sort of in the same way we do with risk zones for right. flooding. So what I heard on our first call about this was that the modeling companies that work for the insurance company, there's one in Boston called AIR Worldwide and another one called RMS. And um, they do have those kind of maps that they can provide the insurers so they can make premiums based on what the actual risk is for hurricanes and nor'easters. Yeah, well, well so that's, I think, uh, the, the question. Like, Are they correct? I mean, I, I, I'm not sold on that. I'd like to see yeah. the results and I'd like to you know, see data that um, justifies using them. But I think that that's exactly the kind of product that we need, though. So it's worth if if we can get access to that stuff, we should do an assessment. I'll take it up on our next call. Do, does your company have them, Wayne? Do you have access to that stuff already? I don't think so. No, the the model. My understanding is what AIR and RMS use are proprietary models. Um, the the reinsurance companies might have their own too, like yeah, yeah. Um, so we UConn's done some work on this too, but uh, I, I guess it was it was too late for us really to to uh, build it into our planning without um, you know didn't, didn't think of it quickly enough. Yeah, it might come out of um, NOAA or something like that. You know, with the with the new federal funding, maybe they're gonna look at modeling this type of stuff as well. I think they're trying to catch up on stormwater and flooding. Any other thoughts, um, comments? I, I want to acknowledge the chat. So there's been a couple of comments in the chat. Carl Amenta from Sprague and then Denise Savageau um, had some, some thoughts um, as well as uh, Peter Alexander in the beginning. So we, we see all your comments. Thank you, everybody. We will incorporate that. I do just want to make a quick note that um, we did receive a few responses in the survey that I sent out in the pre-workshop, but um, it's still open. So feel free now that we've kind of walked through the resilience opportunity areas and a little bit more of what's going into these. Um, feel free. It's only, I think it's five questions, so it's super quick, but, um, you know, give us a little more feedback on, you know, what we're taking into account. Um, you know, if you, you might be able to be a little more specific in some of those kind of open-ended responses. So um, if you have a few minutes, uh, you know, that's another opportunity to provide feedback as well as the link that Katie posted to the Circle website. So just wanted to give that a, a quick plug as well. But 
Otherwise, I, that's it from me. I think the best way to find out about some of these next steps in terms of when the report draft would come out and when the public comment or you know the future workshops is um, we always do uh, a posting in our monthly newsletter in the Resilience Roundup and we'll have things on our website too. But if you don't get that Resilience Roundup newsletter, you can subscribe to that on our Circa website. So that's probably the best way to stay informed. At the top of that monthly newsletter, which has a lot of information in terms of grants, um, resources that come out, resilience and climate related news. But at the very top, we always put the different um, Resilient Connecticut events and resources that are new for that month. Okay. Anything else? No. So we do, um, Noah, Victoria, just leave the meeting open for a minute after, after folks leave just so we can, there's one thing I need to settle up with, with Katie. Um, so don't close the meeting for me. Thanks. Okay. Well, thanks for joining everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you for hosting this today. This was yeah. wonderful. Thanks. I totally agree. Thank you. Very productive. Thank you. Good. Thanks everybody. Thank you.